Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay with this mic? Okay, great. Um, great to see you. Um, good morning, still. Feels like afternoon. I'm Lauren Strauss. I teach in the Jewish Studies and Israel Studies programs here at American University. And um, we're just thrilled to be hosting this important conference and, um, and really happy that almost all of our speakers were able to be here. And of course, really, uh, it's wonderful to see this audience and especially the students. Um, so the uh, topic of this panel is Arab-Jewish divide. And you'll hear, of course, uh, from our speakers that that is much more nuanced than the title suggests. Um, We're going to hear from three speakers and then a respondent. And the respondent you heard from last night, um, if you were here, if you were lucky enough to be here. And uh, I will just briefly say something about each person now. Their full bios are in the um, handy dandy booklet that you have. Our first speaker will be Raha Jiraisi, um, who is here from the organization Sikui Ufok, which is a uh, Hebrew Arabic title of an, uh, an organization that works toward a uh, shared society in Israel. And she will uh, speak first and tell us her story, and uh, which is an incredible one. And uh, it's really uh, wonderful that, that you're here. Um, le- next, we will hear from Ayala Hendon. And um, just to underscore a um, little fun fact, to un- underscore how small is this country that we're, uh, we're talking about today. Last night at dinner, Ayala and I just discovered that my mother-in-law and her mother go way back decades of friendship. And so this is just, you know, one, one tiny little example of what a really small place we're talking about here, which is important to keep in mind. Um, when we discuss these issues. And then we'll hear from Rebecca Bardach, who is a um, who is a social change activist and a talented writer um, who is originally from America and uh, has been living in Israel for a few decades. And our respondent will be uh, Mohammed Darwashe, who you heard from last night. And Mohammed is uh, very well known and uh, really not only one of the best known representatives of the Palestinian Israeli community or Israeli Arab community, but also really significantly um, his major, uh, his primary place of work for years has been uh, Givat Chaviva, which is, uh, I believe, the oldest uh, shared society, Arab-Jewish shared society organization in Israel. And uh, and he also works other places. So uh, you all are really lucky um, to to have this uh, opportunity. And after the the, uh, speakers and the response, um, we will then come up here and we will take uh, questions from the audience. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Laura, for the invitation and for this important gathering. I'm Rada Jaraisi. I'm a Palestinian Arab woman, um, citizen of Israel, originally from uh, Nazareth, the capital Arab city of the northern part of uh, Israel, and for years, a hub and anchor for the Arab society and leadership in Israel. Today, I'm a mother of two little boys, and I live together with my partner and kids in Nofa Galil. Nofa Galil is the neighbor mixed city near Nazareth that was established and built on the historical lands of the people of Nazareth and the neighbor villages after their confiscation in 48. It was built and established as a Jewish city and as part of the famous Judaizing the North and the Negev project that has started a few years after the establishment of the State of Israel. I am the co-executive director of Sikui Ufuq. Sikui Ufuq is an Arab-Jewish organization promoting equality between Arabs and Jews, the Arab and Jewish societies in Israel, and the shared society based on full equality between individuals and collectives. We do that mainly through advocacy, together with our partners, 
uh, in the civil society and representative bodies of the Palestinian Arab uh, minority in uh, Israel and in front of the government, both the bureaucracy level and politicians. Before that, I work at, worked at ACRI, the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, as a lawyer promoting equality for the Arab society in Israel in legal instruments. I was involved in um, writing the petition against the nation state law, working on the Nakba law and um, the um, admissions committee law and other legislations and policies discriminating the Arab society um, in Israel. It is not a secret that um, the new Israeli government is a threat to the Arab society on all levels, political, cultural, uh, material level, as it is a threat to the general society. And of course, not only to the society in Israel, but also to the Palestinians living under occupation. I can talk a lot about the direct and indirect implications of this government on our daily life on our ability to seek justice through the judicial system, even if it was specific and limited before, uh, on our ability to raise the Palestinian flag and to participate in the political game in Israel, uh, on the allocation of budgets and resources to the economic and social development of the Arab localities and to narrowing the historic huge gaps between Arabs and Jews in Israel through important government decisions that have been approved in the last few years, to the important and crucial st struggle against crime and violence in our localities that the government is not only not fighting, but taking advantage of, and I will refer to this shortly. And I have a lot of examples. But today, I choose to talk about the fact that despite this threat, and the dangerous implications of this government on our society, the, uh, the Arab voice isn't heard or isn't he heard enough. And the Israeli protest movement is far from being shared one. I want to try and explain this fact through two main perspectives that refer to the complex relationship between the Arab society and the state of Israel. One is historic and the other is contemporary. I will start with the historic perspective. I want to try and tell the story of the complexity from the point of view of the Palestinian Arab minority in Israel. In 48, when Israel celebrated independence, Palestinian had the Nakba from 1.4 million Palestinians living uh, in the different townships all over the states, about 800,000 were became refugees, were expelled or fled. From 774 towns and villages before the war of 48, only 243 remained. After the independence and the establishment of the state of Israel, when the people of Israel celebrated the only democracy in the Middle East. My people lived under martial, martial law. There were two law regimes applying on two groups of people under the state of Israel. The military, the martial re regime ended in 66, and then started the institutionalized discrimination in all fields of life based off the Jewish supremacy against the Arab minority in Israel. In land allocation, 14% of the Arab uh, minority lives in the Arab localities. Some of them, the other, the rest live in Jewish or mixed cities. 14% 14 live in less than 3% of the lands of Israel. In terms of education, Dan referred to the gaps, and it's very clear I will not expand on that. In food security and employment, and I, the list is very long, and I can go on with examples. I also want 
even when, even when a very important but slow development process started in terms of economic and social development of the Arab localities, of the Arab minority, we moved from a situation of total exclusion of the Arab minority from the services and uh, the resources of the state to a conditional integration, political, um, economic, and social development. But there was a limit, a roof, for this uh, uh, um, inclusion and uh, process of equality by uh, laws like the nation state law, the Nakba law, and other aspects of limiting the collective rights of the Arab minority in Israel. In addition to this situation happening internally between Arabs and Jews, the Arabs and the state of Israel, I also want to refer to the complex relationship in light of the bigger picture, the occupation and the Arab uh, Jewish Palestinian Israeli conflict. The state of Israel sees us, saw us for years as a democratic threat, as the enemy from within. And the uh, previous panel referred to it in terms of the Haredim and the investment in that society and infinite uh, fertility rates and, and so on. And this was part of the basis for the discrimination against the Arab minority in Israel for, for a year. And this affects not only what's going on under occupation, but also inside Israel, the way the state sees its Arab Palestinian population and the way the, Palestinian, the Arab Palestinian population sees the, the, the state and the sense of belonging and uh, the connection, the deep connection they have with Palestinian um, on both sides of the border. So to sum it up, Arabs has never felt, felt equal. Arabs felt or feel that Israel has been a democratic state for Jews and a Jewish state for Arabs. That's why when the protests talk about defending Israel's democracy, Arabs can't see themselves part of this um, um, struggle, of this fight. when the protest demands to go back to the day before this new government, to the day before everything started, it, it's, not, it's not good enough for Arabs. Not because they do not see the threats of the current government, but they, because they don't want to go to the day before. They want to work together on analyzing the past in order to build a better future for everybody in this place. And I think it's very, very important at this crucial point to learn from what happened, from the way democracy was applied on Arabs in Israel, because this is the basis for what's happening today. The same tools and instruments that were used against Arabs by the Israeli democracy is now used not only against Arabs, but also internally in the Jewish-Jewish conflict, if I may say. And I think that without addressing the, the history, without addressing the past, without addressing this discrimination and complex relationship between the state of Israel and the Arab minority, we cannot walk towards a better future, not only for the Arab minority, but also for everybody in this, in this place. Um, so that's, in general, on the level of the historic process, perspective, complex relationship. And I want to say two more things on the con contemporary perspective, from the contemporary perspective on what's going on now. One thing is the nature of the protest. And I'm not going to talk a lot about it. OK. I'm just going to say uh, Mohammed referred to it uh, yesterday, uh, the um, 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 the um, yeah, the the national um, 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 protest, uh, the flags and the demands and everything else, doesn't help the Arabs to be part. Doesn't invite the Arabs to be part. And part 
Arabs feel that they don't belong to this uh, um, um, protest. But the other thing is our own protest going on in our own townships that is not part of the general protest and that is not see seen as a threat to Israel's democracy. And that is our protest against the violation of our basic right to life. The Arab citizens of Israel are facing organized crime that did not come from nowhere. It evolved under the state of Israel and the policies of the state of Israel for years that weakened our society, our township, that uh, um, prevented us from access to basic services like banks and credit and made our people need those crime organizations in order to get loans. And that's how they got bigger and stronger. Since the beginning of 2023, more than 170 Israeli Arab uh, citizens of Israel were murdered. In 2018 until 2022, 70% of the murder victims in Israel were Arabs, 70%, were less than 20% of the population. In 2022, in the Arab society, only 6% of the murder cases were solved versus 52% in the Jewish society. So it's not culture, it's policy. We are for fighting for our lives. The general public is not part of this fight, is not part of this struggle, is not part of this protest. And this does not help building a shared protest or a better future. Well, the story is not very optimistic, but I want to try and <laughs> finish with the, some optimism because that's how we humans are. I think that I try to tell the story, the dramatic story of our reality, but the truth is that it's much more complicated. And the truth is that things are beginning to change. The Arab protest against organized crime is getting stronger and building and having more allies in the general society, and that's a good thing. The Jewish Israeli protest is evolving and changing in terms of the language of what the protest is talking about. Occupation is on the table for the, the first time in tens of years, I think. And the protest in Haifa is not exactly as the protest in Be'er Sheva, in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem. Things are changing. And I think this is also a Jewish-Jewish debate that should happen. And it's a good opportunity to have it, to make it now. And that's why I think, despite all the problems, it's a historical moment. It's an opportunity to put everything on the table, to look not only on the present, and on the fight against, against this government, but also to look at the roots of what's happening in the present, to look at the history and at the complex relationship with the Arab-Palestinian minority, and based on that, to build the demands for a better future. Thank you so much. Thank you to Michael and Laura, who I do not see, for putting this wonderful event together. Um, thank you to all of the speakers for such great food for thought and inspiration on what's going on in Israel currently and as I will claim in the past 75 years. Um, when I try to make sense of complex stories, um, I always go back to thinking about four components of any good story. Okay, to me, any good story is going to always have a setting, is going to have the characters that we're looking at, is going to have a plot, which is um, looking at the sequence of events and the connections between them, and is going to have some kind of a moral. Um, so we heard one story right now that's kind of interesting to think of um, through those components, and I'm going to try very briefly to do um, a bit of that as I'm looking um, at the current reality and giving some kind of a context to it. Um, so I'm going to start with the setting. And to me, the understanding of the setting um, is very important 
for us to kind of be on the same page as to what we are talking about. Um, and two main questions are where and when are we talking about? When we're talking about, um, about Israeli society being torn, okay, are we talking about the past nine months since this uh, reform was introduced to the public for the first time? Are we talking about the past 36 weeks since the first protest started? Or are we talking about the past 75 years? Okay, and to me, um, the crucial moment is 75 years ago um, when Israel for the first time created a dynamic of three groups. We have um, Jewish citizens, we have Arab citizens, and we have Arab non-citizens all living um, under Israeli rule. Um, the other things that we see already 75 years ago and they keep reappearing, um, if we look at the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Independence gave a deadline for putting together a constitution. Okay. 75 years, it was a deadline, um, if I'm not mistaken, for November of 48. Okay. The Declaration was signed in May 48. Um, and here we are in September 2023. Um, someone has not met that deadline yet. Okay. Um, right after the declaration, one of the first things that the state did was declare a state of emergency. 75 years later, um, that state of emergency remains, um, making democracy very easy to work with in whatever ways we want to work with it. Okay. Um, when I think about the characters, I'm going to go back to uh, uh, some of what you, Muhammad, spoke about yesterday. You said, how do we understand um, Israeli nation, or how do we understand Israeli society? Okay, are we thinking um, about Jews all over the, the world? Are we thinking about Israeli Jews? Um, are we thinking about Arabs who are citizens of Israel? Are we thinking about all Arabs, about Arab all Arabs that are under Israeli rule but don't necessarily um, have citizenship? Okay, so that's some of the questions that we have to ask when we're talking about a torn nation. Who is this nation um, that's torn? Um, and the same question applies to, uh, to the title of this session of um, the Jewish-Arab divide. Who are the, these Jews that we're talking about? Who are, who are these Arabs? Um, what is this divide uh, all about? To me, um, all of the groups that I mentioned are part of the current reality and part of the current tier. Um, some experience the flawed democracy since the day that they were born. Um, and for others, it's a newly awakening um, to, uh, to understanding questions um, about the democracy um, leading to kind of like a double and tri triple pandemic uh, in Israel. Here you're talking a lot about your double uh, pandemic as health and systemic racism. And we have two more levels added. We have our democracy pandemic, um, and we have the big elephant in the room, occupation. When I think about the characters, I'm also thinking about political institutions um, and the elected leadership and the people. Um, the sharp tear in trust is, then, is one that will take us years to rebuild. Um, the plot. I'm not going to attempt to go through the entire plot of the uh, 75 years um, or of the past nine months. They had so many events, it's uh, sometimes hard or easy to get lost in all of the uh, details. Um, but I do want to highlight uh, a piece of the plot looking just at the past 15 years um, and through the angle of higher education policy, which is the uh, field that I uh, have been working on both, both as a researcher uh, researcher, a policy um, uh, consultant, activist. Um, so the past 15 years, uh, we've seen a big breakthrough in the civil deal between the state and the Arab citizens. Kind of like the economic peace promoted during the Oslo Agreement, the Oslo Accords, Arab citizens in Israel were for the first time actively invited into the Israeli economic party. Um, as policy makers introduced the, co the concept of economic inclusion. In the background, the OECD report, Israel, a divided society, put a spotlight on the wide economic implications of the low ultra-Orthodox and Arab participation in the Israeli workforce. Israeli government, realizing that economic inclusion is necessary for any kind of effective economic de development and growth agenda, 
found itself allocating greater budgets than ever uh, before to these two communities, with higher education identified as a key leverage of change. The successful policy uh, led to a huge increase in representation of Arab students in undergraduate studies, from about 11% in 2011 when this plan started to 20% in 2021, um, just 10 years later. It created a new reality of a growing Arab middle class that can no longer um, be overlooked. As those de dedicated to equality have been celebrating the success of the in, um, increased equality um, being followed by a shift towards inclusion, the, the new government provided us some harsh reminders of the continuing policy of ethno-national exclusion. Just a month ago, Smotrich, the current finance minister, announced with no shame that higher education budget, budgets already allocated to East Jerusalem residents is going to be pulled. In his populist style, he shared on social media that while investments were supposed to get them out of Birzeit University in El Najah, uh, we ended up getting Birzeit in our universities. A year ago, such a statement would have probably led to much aggravation among those in the equity and equality business. It would have probably come as no surprise to Arabs, right? Um, and would probably not really make it to the ra radar um, of most Jewish um, liberal Israelis, viewing this as kind of a niche issue, not in their backyard. However, the liberal Jewish Israelis of August 23 uh, are not the same ones as those of August 2022. Liberal Jewish Israelis have woken up uh, and for the 30, 36 weeks now uh, are not going to sleep. The, the equality trap where the government sees itself as responsible for equality if it fits a wider national agenda uh, and not responsible for equality when it comes to the lives of the citizens and community is no longer overlooked. Um, the, mor the moral of the current situation um, is where it all starts getting a little tricky. Um, however, in times when hope is so fragile, I want to offer a few thoughts moving forward with some sense of hope. Many mentioned yesterday um, their discomfort with the uh, terminology uh, describing Israeli society as tribes, partly referencing um, former President Rivlin's new Israeli order or four tribe um, speech. I'm personally not yet ready to throw away this terminology, um, partly because I think that it highlights uh, the, the role of the system in creating these tribes. Okay? These tribes are based on the uh, school system in Israel, which is segregated by design um, into four types of schools, secular, orthodox, ultra-orthodox, and Arab. So to me, thinking about tribes is not um, thinking about the people as much and more thinking about the policy constructs creating um, these groups as tribes. Um, at the same time, um, it, and, and thinking about those, the implications of these four separate public school systems with four separate schemes of core curriculum, of budgeting, of autonomy, um, that are all uh, continuously fueling um, the current terror. Um, however, as a long uh, shareholder in the business of hope, um, I want to highlight something that to me is more crucial, um, a more crucial piece of Rivlin's uh, speech, uh, in which he drafts a framework for partnership. In his imagination of a divided Israeli society, he talks about partnership between the tribes as one that will require the security of each group um, that their values are not threatened, equity and equality, um, some level of shared responsibility, all hopefully leading in his mind to assured uh, Israeliness. For Jews and Arabs in Israel, it's time for a new deal. Um, not, no more economic inclusion or partial or conditional partnership. This new deal must maintain education and employment as priorities, um, while also widely investing in housing and transportation and safety and security nets uh, for the actual community. The New Deal must be constructed bottom up uh, and top down, between the people, between the people and the leadership. The understanding of citizenship should be at its core, shifting from partial to substantial citizenship. Is a New Deal feasible? 
Only if we imagine it can we act on it. In 2023, Israel has a new leadership emerging bottom up um, with impressive mechanisms of mo mobilizing the masses. The masses awakened are no longer closing their eyes and ears to inequality, to discrimination, to exclusion. In Israel 2023, there's a larger Arab mid middle class with representatives speaking up in public spheres. In Israel 2023, speaking about violence and crime in Arab lo localities is for the first time not a taboo within the mainstream um, Jewish activism. When democracy is something um, the public is widely engaged with, when people are mobilizing in greater scope than ever before, chanting demands for equality, I'm hopeful that if we all, the, if we all put efforts into it, a new deal can emerge. Optim optimism may seem naive uh, and suffering from some disconnect. However, to me, it's in the only way to put a working plan into action, leaving at least some potential for success. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to dive right in here. Um, Obviously, our topic here is the Jewish-Arab divide, and I want to try to focus uh, the bulk of what I'm going to talk about, about how we can overcome and work on this divide. First of all, it requires a clear goal about what we're working towards, and I think much of that can be found, um, to some extent, is what Muhammad talked about, the shared civic identity. And we're talking a lot in the, in the work that's being done in Israel about shared society and about civic partnership between the Jewish and Arab citizens of Israel. I also, like a number of the speakers here have talked about, see this current political crisis as something which highlights both the absolute urgency and necessity of doing this work, which has been important now for many years, um, but really this is now even more urgent, and it presents an incredible opportunity that we have to take advantage of. The work that's being done in shared society, which is very intensive and very intentional, and has now many years of experience under their, under their belt, offers, I think, important examples on what can be done and how to do it, insights and inspiration, which definitely serve this moment. And I'm going to try to go into some of those things. I just want to go a little bit more into why it's such an urgent um, uh, moment now that we're dealing with. First of all, the current government's agenda, and uh, the, the advantage of coming a little later in this is that a lot of people have spoken about this, so I don't have to go into depth. But as we see, it's very much rooted in the idea of the primacy of Jewish rights over the rights of Palestinians and Arabs in a very clear-cut way. It's capitalizing on the terrible state of affairs in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the long-standing complicated relations uh, between the Jewish and Arab citizens of Israel. There's an absolutely clear agenda for annexation, which is being promoted by many of the key players in this government. They see it as absolutely legitimate, um, and they uh, that solution, as they're seeing it, has many catastrophic um, aspects to it, which I think we need to be taking very seriously. Uh, with it, we are seeing a real delegitimization and demotion of the status of Arab citizens, which is only worsening the issues of inequality. Um, you know, we heard about the violence and the crime issues. So there's a lot of uh, harm, negative impact emerging from that. But as I said, this coalition presents an opportunity. They're absolutely transparent. For a number of years, we've seen all sorts of things with the growing trend towards the far right that wasn't always so clear. I think now it's very clear because they're unabashed in their, um, in their goal and in their language about it and their belief in it. It's shocking to many people, as Ayala was just talking about, and that is creating an awakening that's going beyond the sort of left fringes to mainstream Israeli Jews who are saying, wait a minute, this doesn't represent what we think we believe in. And I think it's creating a much more willingness to look and to analyze. The question is, can we translate that protest to agency and change? My own entry point to these issues of shared society very much came from an awareness of the growing extremism some years back in 2009. I'm originally American, as you can hear from my accent, grew up in, a, in California, Jewish day school, youth movement, strong connection to Israel. Um, I worked for a number of years with Bosnian refugees and other refugees, and that made me, I think, particularly aware of just where conflict can take us and how much even more catastrophic it could be. And when I moved to Israel in uh, 1998, I very much felt like I wanted to somehow get into these issues. It was obviously post-Oslo, post-Rabin's assassination. I came from 
Bosnia and post-war Bosnia and seeing what a devastation that war had done. And I felt this real urgency to do something. I couldn't really figure out what and how. Some years passed, about 10 years later, 2009, I began to notice these issues of growing extremism. More and more um, mayors and rabbis paid by our state taxes saying, don't rent to Arabs. No responses. More and more issues of delegitimizing and removing women from uh, the public sphere in all sorts of ways. And most disturbing of all was the growing phenomenon of the uh, pr price tag attacks, the extremist settler stuff, death to Arabs graffiti, attacks and uh, vandalism. And I kept thinking, where is the response? Why is there not more of a response to these horrible things? And especially coming from the background I'd come from, I felt like we need to take this seriously, we need to start acting. That pathway brought me specifically to the world of Hand in Hand, a Jewish Arab uh, network of schools, first as a parent and as a senior leader. Um, and But there's many different ways to get involved in Hand in Hand. I mean, sorry, in shared society issues. And I wanna, for a moment, just define clearly what we're talking about with, with shared society. First of all, it's about equity and fairness between the Jewish and Arab citizens of Israel. That means budgets, policies, practices, creating more opportunities. It's shifting from a zero sum uh, approach towards a, an approach of cooperation, of mutual acceptance, mutual recognition, and accepting the reality, we're here, no one's leaving. This is the reality, like it or not, there's those who, who are eager for it and you know, sort of embrace it, there's those who obviously don't. That's the reality we have to work with, we're interdependent. And we have to make sure that the, the only way we're gonna both succeed uh, is going to be ultimately together. The work of shared society is, um, I think, very much defined by working together and in partnership. I think when you come from a sort of a liberal Jewish background, it can be a little bit easy to stay for all sorts of reasons about the separation and uh, many things about the reality of Israeli society to, to do that separately and to have liberal values and attitudes towards these issues without the reality of working together. I think that process of working together on an ongoing basis in partnership, in relationship, takes you much further than you can go alone just from a theoretical approach. There's a lot of, and, and ultimately I think one of the key things, and this came up a little bit I think in, in uh, what I was saying, there's a change of consciousness. Policy change alone only goes so far. There's a change of consciousness that has to happen that's challenging for both sides in different ways. As a Jewish Israeli, uh, part of what I'm gonna look at is in particular, I think what are some of the challenges on the Jewish side in terms of that change of consciousness. Um, there's, I just wanna mention in terms of the kinds of uh, shared society efforts, there's the programs that are very intentionally and, and entirely about shared society coming together with often some sort of common goal that's about some targeted issue and often with the putting these Jewish Arab issues at the center of it um, or as a part, a part of it. It could be shared society practices and attitudes in a non-shared society program, uh, schools that happen to be mixed or workplaces, um, cities, other neighborhoods, other contexts where the reality is Jews and Arabs living together but no one's really diving into those issues or touching them at all. Um, and I also see it as a way of seeing. I feel like over the years of my work with, uh, with shared society, I've developed, relatively speaking, a much more bifocal lens where I'm seeing things not only from the automatic Jewish lens that I grew up with, but increasingly able to see a lot of the things through the eyes and experiences of my colleagues and my friends and my uh, you know, partners uh, in this kind of work. So with all that said, I think shared society has an important role um, to play at this moment. The coalition has a very clear agenda and vision and policies that they're recommending and they're rapidly pursuing it. And, and this comes in part because of the vacuum around the issues of occupation. Um, we need an alternative vision and plan in order to help counter what they're doing. Uh, this is also an electoral reality and pragmatic necessity that to get a coalition that's going to be able to counter that, we know needs to also involve in a serious way the Arab parties. Um, and therefore the civic partnership that we see in the day-to-day -day work of shared society efforts, I think has a lot to offer at this moment. It's not easy because the work is complicated. It has all these historical levels and there's a lot of layers that have to be dealt with. Um, and so one of the challenges, how do we do that rapidly enough to make it relevant to today? Um, so the work of shared society has to meet a, a, and address a lot of those issues. Um, that includes the, the question of the attitude, there's no partner for peace, which is definitely a very dominant uh, approach among many Israeli Jews vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, but that affects the way they see Arab citizens. The fear is a massive aspect that, that alone you can do a lot of analysis on. The reality of separation, separate schools, 
uh, the tracks that Ayala mentioned, separate living, et cetera, means that there's very little contact um, between those different groups. And there's strong narratives that are developed and ways that we're being taught that are only exacerbating those divides. Um, and a number of other factors. I, I want to focus on also the fact that there's, as a result of all this, a terrible sense of despair and apathy that I think until recently, the vast majority of Israeli Jews, post Oslo, post the Second Intifada especially, we've seen a real shift into the sense of there's nothing to do. We're washing our hands of it, we're giving up, we're building a wall, and we're going to try to forget about it as much as we can. That despair and apathy leads to a lack of agency and people giving up on trying. And I think that's a huge part of the problem also. And with it, you have a rightward shift that we see also in the world, but it's definitely happened for specific reasons in Israel. And you've seen a hollowing out of the center and left, in part also because there's a, they don't have much of a different paradigm. And so they don't have a good alternative to what the right and the far right has been offering, except, well, it's not quite so nice how you're putting it. We don't totally agree with the extremes, but we don't actually really believe that there's work to be done or a partner to work with either. So you have to counter that. Um, into this steps the work of shared society, which has been developing over the last number of years. Not perfect, not always easy, lots of work still be to be done, but I think a lot of important insights and successes to learn from. In some ways, it touches on issues that we've been talking about you know, throughout the last day and a half. Language, religion, symbols, history, commemoration, policies, budgets, the traumas of Nakba, the traumas of Holocaust, and the persecution that the Jewish you know, history obviously uh, has experienced. Um, and it, you have to be touching on many of these issues in order to really advance the work of shared society. And I want to go into a few examples. So language, it's a simple one. Hebrew and Arabic. Uh, Hebrew is obviously the dominant language until the nation state law in 2018. Arabic had been an equal language. It was demoted in its status. So uh, there's a reality, A, of uh, political status, but also of communication. Many Arabs uh, don't always know Hebrew or know it as comfortably uh, as, as Jews do. Most Jews don't know Arabic. So one of the core things for many shared society programs is how do we uh, try to create as much bilingualism as possible, given the fact that there's, you know, again, most of the Jews aren't going to know Arabic and Arabs more, more Hebrew, but uh, can also be limited. Um, so the shared society programs are trying to figure out how do we do written communications, our meetings, public signage, uh, all these different aspects that are the very practical aspects of language. But one aspect of that is also the psychological component. Uh, one of the parents who joined Hand in Hand a few years ago come, you know, joined as a Jewish parent, very eager to do it. But he described one of the first moments coming into the school and, and hearing a few, you know, he's passing by a few of the Arab parents and they're talking in Arabic to each other. And this f instinct of fear that filled him because of growing up during the second intifada and the fear when you get onto buses, is this bus going to explode? So one of the core things that you're seeing there is how do you, how do you address that instinctive response, not just teach language? Um, you see a similar thing, for example, in women in East Jerusalem when, they're, when they have the opportunity to be learning uh, Hebrew, which many of them have less access to even than their husbands who are more likely to be working. They're often describing how they're feeling much more comfortable and confident and competent uh, in the Jewish spaces. So that's just one example. Um, Another example is around uh, the calendar. The, the primary calendar in Israel is the Jewish calendar. Um, and yet, obviously, with 20% uh, Arabs, you've got a significant percent who are Muslim and a, and a percent also who are Christian. Those holidays have very little space and place uh, you know, in, in the public um, sphere. There's often hostility, can be hostility towards it. You have employers who are not always willing to accommodate those religious holidays. You've had situations where Christmas trees are forbidden. Um, it can be very alienating to, to the people who are not Jews. Of course, secular Jews also have, uh, you know, feel some of those effects. So the shared society approach is how do we create space and, and knowledge and practice uh, and respect for the three religious traditions? That might be even a, a fully shared calendar, which is what we have at hand in hand. But it, it's, you know, that's something that many of the shared society organizations have is various ways of bringing in uh, those religious traditions. I know people at workplaces who are in primarily Jewish, you know, it's a Jewish workplace in essence, and they realized, wait, I've got Arab workers. It's now Rosh Hashanah and Eid al-Adha. So instead of just sending out my Rosh Hashanah greetings for the Jewish New Year, I should also combine it with Eid al-Adha. And instead of doing a, you know, a Shaila Chag, like a gift for the holiday of a bottle of wine, which for the Muslims uh, would be, would be 
you know, nice, they can give it away, but it's not going to be something that means something to them. Let's figure out a gift that everybody will feel is meaningful. These workplaces now are attracting some of the top Arab uh, technicians in their, in their fields. That's just another small example. Um, there's a lot of examples. We're not going to go into all of them. But uh, I think it's important that the, a lot of this is about retraining our instincts, beginning to see both sides and understand both experiences. Um, there's a knowing that I, I think there's two kinds of knowing. There's sort of the one-dimensional theoretical knowing. As a, you know, a liberal, open person, I can understand an Arab perspective. And I think it's a very different kind of knowing that happens when you're in relationship, you're working together, you're working on the issues together. I think it creates a much greater sense of understanding and a sense of compulsion to work about it. It's not just, well, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. No, we have to do something about it. I'm obligated to you. And we have to try to figure out what we can do about these things. And where there's a will, there's a way. There's a lot of issues that can be improved upon. There's a lot of ideas for how to do it. Um, it's about recognizing the gap between our vision of what we want to be and the reality. As Rad said, the, uh, in many ways, it's been a democracy for Jews and Jewish for Arabs. That's something that you don't see on average, you know, as a, as a Jewish Israeli and beginning to see uh, how that's the case. Um, just briefly on, con you know, trying to get a little more concrete on what to do, and obviously we could spend days on those questions. There's a lot of efforts that are current and existing that should be um, scaled up, that should be supported. There's, we can target a lot of the places that are de facto uh, where Jews and Arabs are working together already, be it in places of work, be it in areas, you know, where people are living, residential areas, mixed cities. Um, these are the areas where often there's a need, often these issues are untouched, it's the elephant in the room. Uh, they come up throughout the year between the religious things, between the, you know, Yom uh, Independence Day and Nakba Day. These are, these are, they're there and they're often completely untouched. You have to bring it in and it starts uh, to allow people to work on these issues. There's policy recommendations that are out there and that are solid. The state comptroller report came out in 2015 with a complete analysis of the school system and of the problems of the four tract systems and what should be done to address it. Bits and pieces have been taken. It's all there. The analysis is there. We can be taking it. This current government is trying to undermine policies and budgets uh, that have been advanced in some significant ways. We have to be protecting and stopping that with absolute clarity on the importance of it and not permitting them to be doing that. Um, the power of stories. Uh, I used to hate this idea of narrative. I sort of felt like it was belittling uh, the gravity of what we're all dealing with. But the truth is that, uh, and I think we've seen this a lot both in Israel but also in America, the power of narrative is often um, greater and uh, outweighs the power of reality. And the narratives that we have in Israel are of being enemies. And there's very little out there about the narratives of how we overcome and how we work together. And that's definitely something you find in the work of shared society. I've seen millions of examples of it. And those are the stories that we need to be coming out in all sorts of ways. Um, and I don't just mean media stories. There's a lot of different ways to think about it. But I would just say to connect to this moment, demonstrations. We need those people up there. There's a lot of reasons that are very real why people are why the Arab side is not up there. We need Jews and Arabs who are in partnership, standing up there, sharing these stories and example with this awakened crowd. <laughs> Elections. Obviously, that's the long-term uh, set of issues is becoming more significant politically. This is short-term work. It's long-term work. It's work for now. Am I optimistic? Am I pessimistic? My approach is, is there what to do? And the answer is yes. There's a lot of things we can be doing, and we need to be doing it. Thank you. OK, so I have like 50 comments as a respondent, and Lauren says, be brief. Uh, so I'm going to try to be brief, and I think what I'll do first is zoom out and then try to zoom in again. When I zoom out, I want to start with Ayala, basically the discussion of where do we start when we talk about the Jewish-Arab divide. Yes, we can go back to 1948 until 1966, the military administration, martial law, uh, uh, described as martial law type of effort. But I think that the real development in Jewish-Arab relations in Israel actually started uh, immediately after the Oslo Agreements. Uh, after the Oslo Agreements, uh, basically, it's called the, the power of omission. Uh, you know, my undergraduate degree is in English literature and political science, and I always say I think I learned more politics in English literature than in political science. 
And uh, one of my professors used to say, when you read the text, read the subtext. Read what's missing. So when you read the Oslo agreements, which are supposed to be the negotiating the end of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and you look for the paragraphs that deal with 20% of the Palestinian people, who are the Arab citizens of Israel, who happen to be 20% of the Israeli citizens. You look for the paragraphs and pages and uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe even uh, whole chapters that are supposed to deal with this issue. What do you find? Zero mention. So what also said to Arab citizens, maybe you thought you are part of the problem, but you're not part of the solution. Seek your own destiny, and your destiny is going to be inside the state of Israel. And what that meant, basically, do two things. One is re-Palestinization, because now being Palestinian became legal. Israel was negotiating with the Palestinians. So we went through the re-Palestinization celebration of our ethnic national identity. But at the same time, parallel to that, re, uh, parallel to that, Israelization. And it was expected that the whole problem would be resolved by the Israelization process of the Arab citizens. What was missing was the need of the Israelization of the Jewish population, which went into more Judaization. The Jewish people said, OK, we're going to give the Palestinians maybe a state in Oslo. But the rest is going to be going to go through enhanced Judaization up to the level of racism as it's developing right now, or Jewish supremacy as we're beginning to see it developing right now. Uh, the other uh, point that is important in this context, uh, I mentioned that uh, maybe what provoked the economic integration of Arab citizens was the OECD report that basically said it's good for Israel to invest in the economic well-being of Arab citizens. Because an Arab citizen who makes 10,000 shekels is going to pay more taxes. While if they make only minimum wage, they're exempted from taxes. So it's good for the economy. Economically speaking, yes, that is true. But I think the real uh, uh, depth of the integration process started a bit before with the Oslo approach, realizing that the Arab citizens are there to stay even after a post-diplomatic arrangement between Israel and the Palestinians. And the more significant uh, uh, political development was the Rabin government. The Rabin government was the first political cooperation between the Arab political parties and uh, the center left in Israel, or the liberal camp in Israel. It wasn't Mansour Abbas a couple of years ago. That's a new version that we like to think it, it broke the taboo. The real taboo was broken in 1992 with Rabin government uh, ruling de being dependent on what was called then the preventive bloc, Hadash with three, Arab, with three members of the Knesset, and the Democratic Arab Party with, the two, with two seats in the Knesset, providing uh, the majority for Rabin to actually do significant things, one, within the state of Israel, and second, cross-border, meaning the negotiations with the Palestinians, the elephant in the room, which was mentioned here. Without dealing with the elephant in the room, you cannot just have a superficial Jewish-Arab cooperation, political cooperation, that focuses only on economic issues, as Mansour Abbas has tried to do with, in, in the coalition of uh, Bennett Lapid, who tried to avoid the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and only focus on economic integration of Arab citizens, what's called economic peace, according to the language of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, the second point I want to mention on the zoom out still place, that how do we define shared society, Rebecca? Uh, you, you use the term shared society. Uh, I, big, I would like to widen it. You know, when we talk about shared society, by the way, when we ask Israeli Jews, do you support the notion of shared society? That has two main components, good relations from one end and equality from the other end. 65 to 68% of the Jewish population say yes. So we're in a good place. More than 85% of the Arab citizens say yes. So we're even in a better place. Where's the problem? The problem is not with that percentage of support. The, the problem is in what is supposed to come first, the good relations or equality. Now, most Jews say good relations first. This will lead towards equality. Most Arab citizens say equality first. This will lead towards good relations, and each is standing on the other side of the spectrum, waiting for the other side to come towards it. These are, so, in my perspective, these are supposed to be two parallel tracks and not two conditional tracks. Right now, they're still seen as 
two conditional strikes. We will reward you with good relations if you treat us equally, or we will reward you with equality if you behave and be engaged in coexistence. Also, when we talk about these two components, good relations, it also goes through three different categories. One, the old school of coexistence, a social contact theory for all of us for, that come from the field of conflict resolution. The social contact theory basically assumes that all what we need to do is be nice to each other and know how to smile and have what we call hummus coexistence. You know, just eat hummus and everything will be okay. <laughs> uh, this is the apple pie American style. You know, uh, we come celebrate culture, enjoy each other's company, but the problem is we go home and we go home to unequal reality that is still structured. So it, it has a very short, a, a lasting impact. It expires, the coexistence concept, the social contact expires very, very quickly. Uh, we call it the returning home syndrome. And within hours to sometimes maybe a couple of years, the impact of the intervention models of the projects that Rebecca mentioned expires. Uh, and mainly because we still live in separate uh, uh, residential reality. 92% of Arab citizens live in separate Arab towns and, and uh, villages. And those 8% that live in mixed cities mostly live in separate neighborhoods. Worst is if you look at the educational system. There are almost 5,000 schools in Israel. Only about eight of them or nine of them that are mixed schools, such as the Hand in Hand in school or the school in, uh, at, at Gibat Khabiba. Only about eight or nine out of 5,000, almost 99.9% of the educational system is still segregated. And yes, we are managing to engineer some encounters here and there. Some are still based, you know, with the younger generation are based on the social contact theory because with younger kids, you can't really do much more. With higher school kids, we try to integrate the second theory, which is called the narrative debate or identity debate theory, we talk about the problems, we allow the elephant in the room, two elephants, equality, occupation, we talk about the problems, about narratives, who did what to whom, when, and we manage to agree to disagree. That's the maximum you can get out of this dialogue, a narrative debate, agree to disagree, which means also it has a limited impact. It's very enriching, it's very uh, educational, uh, uh, you feel that you manage to spill out your heart and tell the, your story, but at the end of the day, because we still live under an active conflict, we're not post-conflict. Narrative and identity debate is usually very effective in post-conflict situation. We're still in conflict, and that's why it has limited level of impact. The third approach that uh, we I touched on yesterday and uh, some of my colleagues also touched on today is a, a theory which is called in, in conflict resolution, it's called the superordinate goal theory. And the superordinate goal theory basically says, focus on mutual interests. The Jews need more doctors, so they create space, and Arab citizens create capacity, and then you have a win-win relationship. The high-tech industry today needs the brain power that is hidden in the Arab community, so they create more opportunities for Arab citizens to study high-tech, and they create more training, retraining programs of Arab academics to go into the high-tech industry. Again, it's the mutual interest theory. The Arab citizens want the better jobs. The Jewish citizens want accessible brain power, which is in the country instead of trying to reach, it, reach for it in India or in China. And you have this interdependency that can develop as a result of it. This is maybe a faster track and more uh, convenient way of, of managing relations, but it works. It works and it is allowing us to see more and more what I would call islands of success in Jewish Arab relations. We cannot talk about a massive interdependency developing, but the medical industry, which I mentioned yesterday, indicates that that is a very successful island of success. In the academia, we're beginning to see that. 23% of the engineering students in Israeli universities, 23% are Arab students. Where are they going to work? in the Israeli economy. They're going to be making two, three times the average wage. They're going to be creating an Arab middle class. And an Arab middle class will behave like an Arab middle class. They will be paying seven, eight dollars for a stupid cup of coffee. <laughs> That's the same practice that Israeli Jewish middle class does. So Arab citizens will be seen in cafes sipping coffee on the same table like Jewish citizens and not just be the waiters. 
that bring the coffee. That's changing. You, you mentioned about the Jewish, the public sphere. The public sphere in Israel is going to be forced to change to accommodate this, evo uh, this growing uh, middle Arab middle class that you get in, in, if you go to hospitals, you see that in the cafeteria, it's Arab doctors that are also sitting there and not just the janitors. And it forces a level of respect in the public sphere. And if you know the address of Mr. or Mrs. Uh, COVID, give it to me. I want to thank them. Because COVID showed the value of the, of the Arab medical staff in Israel where we were fighting a joint battle, we were fighting a joint war with an, with an exceptional added value of the Arab citizens as being the main soldiers in front of this enemy, COVID. That's why that enemy deserves thank you from this perspective. Now, I'll, I'll start zooming in. Clearly, clearly, I'm, I'm not, clearly. Now, a, a, zooming in, there are a few interesting, you know, and, you know we, we spoke and we heard from previous uh, speakers about the problems with the uh, religious Zionism, which is a problem, I think it's the biggest problem, the Haredi uh, issue as well. But uh, we still see some interesting trends within the Arab community that allow me to at least continue to work in this field because we can see some signs, some positive signs. Uh, I mentioned the segregated educational system. Some people do not like to call it segregated. They call it separate, but it is segregation. Uh, and it is different kind of, of, uh, of content. And in a separate education uh, system, you can never talk, you can never reach equality, and you can never reach also a common sense of identity. You have, we have different streams of education that create different creatures of citizenship. And uh, still, we're, we've been able to infl infiltrate the system in a number of interesting ways. In 2005, I was one of the people that initiated the project, uh, which is called Cross-Sector Teachers Project. We started with six Arab teachers teaching Arabic in six Jewish schools. Today, this phenomenon has grown to dramatic numbers, operated by a number of organizations. But today, we have almost 2,000 Arab teachers in Jewish schools. Almost half of them teach Arabic, and the other half teach sciences, math, and uh, uh, English. And we have almost 500 Jewish teachers teaching in Arab schools, mostly teaching Hebrew, but some are already teaching sports and uh, art and things like that. For 93% of the kids that meet a teacher from the other side, this is their first ever encounter with someone from the other side. And because this usually lasts for a couple of years, you do not have that expiration, the returning home syndrome, because that impact happens in the home environment. For 68% of the kids, the impact of having a teacher from the other side changes their perspective from negative to positive about the culture of the other side. So there is a remedy to racism in educational terms. Right now, it's not what you did in America in the 60s, the busing. It was busing of children. Today, we're doing busing of teachers in Israel. We're not at the volume where we have two, three teachers from the other side in every school. We only have 2,500 teachers spread over 5,000 schools. So basically, it's, it's uh, less than almost a quarter of where we need to be. But that's, you begin to see some change happening in, in, in that arena. Uh, Rad mentioned that she lives in Nofa Galil, a mixed city. Uh, that does not that denies the fact that it's a mixed city. Uh, it's a town that has almost 30% Arab population and still insists that it's a Jewish city. While other towns, such as Tel Aviv, which has maybe 5% Arab population in Jaffa, says that they are a mixed city. Haifa, with about 10% Arab population, they say they are a mixed city. And as such, they adopt mixed uh, shared society uh, uh, policies. While Nofa Galil, and other towns that have significant, much larger mass of Arab citizens still live in denial regarding the identity of the population that they have and the need to practice policies that work towards equal integration. By the way, the term equal integration of Arab citizens was a term that was created by the OR Commission, uh, which was published in October, in October 2003, to substitute the previous policy 
of the state of Israel towards Arab citizens. The previous policy, what was it? To convince Arab citizens this is not their state. Since 2009 until today, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's governments have legislated 28 anti-Arab laws, crowned by the uh, nation state law in 2018, but it's only one out of 28 discriminatory laws that should be a shame for any state that calls itself democratic or a state that calls itself even Jewish. That's constitutional structural problem that needs to be resolved. So that takes me back to a topic that I mentioned earlier. When we talk about Jewish Arab equality, we feel more comfortable talking about social economic uh, equality. Very few insist about the political equality. And by the way, I'm not the one that chooses to distinguish between political equality and uh, social equality. That distinction was made in the Declaration of Independence. Israel promised in the Declaration of Independence two types of equality to Arab citizens, political equality and social equality. They chose to distinguish between that. So socially and economically, we are moving in the right direction, very too slow, too slow because meanwhile, the, uh, the separate other educational systems are not catching up. The religious education is not catching up. The national religious and the Haredi is not part of this sphere of, of cross-sector uh, uh, education. When we talk about the skills to live in a shared society, you need bilingualism, you need biculturalism. Uh, I totally agree with that. Uh, but you also need the political atmosphere that allows that. So you cannot talk about biculturalism by, and, and, and bilingualism and that we are all human beings and still say, OK, the budget for uh, uh, municipal services is going to continue to be uh, uh, different. I, I speak Arabic, Hebrew, English, and body language. And the body language of Lauren is also as it uh, was yesterday. I still have a couple of more, uh, more sentences I want to add. Uh, one is that crisis is not always a problem. It's not always bad. We just experienced the May 21 events, uh, especially in mixed cities, uh, with clashes between Jewish and Arab citizens in mixed cities. But interesting result of it is that an increased interest of the residents of these cities with shared society type of programs. At Givat Haviva last year, we had four times more youth encounter activities than the previous year. Quadrupled amount of schools coming to ask for programs that teach towards shared society most of it coming from mixed cities. Basically realizing that leaving Jews and Arabs to live together doesn't work. You need to engineer the programs. You need to engineer educational programs. So last year we had four times more activity. This year we have three times more orders than last year. So in comparison to two years ago, we're talking about 12 times more interest in youth in, in youth encounters where Jewish and Arab youth will meet with each other. So that's, that's, a, that's a light, maybe at the end of the tunnel, uh, but it tells you that at least a certain segment of Israeli population, and I would focus that it's mostly the liberal camp in the Jewish community, is rediscovering a, an existential issue, that they cannot come back to power unless they create political partnership or with Arab citizens. To get to political partnership, you need to go through social economic partnership. We asked a question in our May conference at Givat Haviva about, do you support integration of Arab political parties in future coalitions in Israel? This question was asked by Haifa University by Professor Sam Smoha also in 2019 and 2021. We brought the, uh, the same question with the same suppliers, the same institutions. We had very interesting data. Let me share with you the responses. Do you support the participation of Arab political parties in a future coalition among Jews? In 2019, 35% of Jews supported that. 2021, when it actually happened, 
the number grew to 43%. Today, among Jews, it's 47% support versus 46% opposing it. For the first time, despite all the political turmoil that we're going through, under the worst government ever, for the first time, we have a Jewish majority supporting the integration of an Arab political party in coalition among Arab citizens. In 2019, the support was 57%. After it happened in 2021, it dropped to 53%. But today, it's 79% support. I think that these are optimistic directions, despite the severe overall picture. Uh, and I'll end with one sentence. I think you know the debate about whose state is it? Uh, we started with that. Uh, is it the state of the Jews or, with the, or is it the state of its citizens? I just wrote an article about this. It's in a book that uh, just appeared in English also called 75 Faces to the Jewish State. And my article basically says that uh, no state cannot, no state can be the, st the state or no state can choose to be not the state of its citizens. And Israel has, can, and is, is able to be both the nation state of the Jewish people, but at the same time, be the state of its citizens. These are not two contradicting arguments. Most people see them as two contradicting arguments. I see them as actually completing uh, uh, arguments that answer the need of the Jewish population from one end and answer the need of the indigenous Palestinian Arab citizens of the state. Thank you very much. So you've given us a lot to think and talk about. Um, and, uh, and I have a question um, that actually, since my wonderful student Sarah has a question, I, will, uh, I wanna hear from her first and I'll ask at the end. Hi, I'm Sarah. I had a question for uh, uh, Mr. Mohammed, actually. Um, I was wondering, you had mentioned the mixed states uh, or the mixed cities in Israel and how like the definition, you know, if it's like 90 to 10 percent, do you think it's good to call these mixed cities? Like, is that a is that a uh, thing that the Arab uh, or Palestinian communities find like a good thing that is like mixed or would you rather they just be referred to Jewish cities if they don't represent like equal numbers of Jewish and Arab populations. So, thank you. Actually, I think that uh, Rahad might be uh, better equipped to answer this question. One, because she's resident of one of those towns. Uh, I think that the, the concept of mixed cities is a good concept. And uh, the more mixed cities we have, the better. Uh, the more mixed cities that recognize the fact that they're mixed cities, which means that the city leadership has to also operate and, and create policies to create kindergartens that are mixed, to create maybe schools that are mixed, uh, to create worship places. Uh, Ragad does not have the right right now in Nofa Galil uh, to have a church. She happens to be Christian. If I would move there as a Muslim, I will not, they're, they're not allow you to have a mosque because they want to maintain the Jewish identity of the city. While a mixed city, will allow you to have worship places also for people with different uh, uh, religious identities or different kind of cultural, social practices. Uh, you know, if, uh, would you allow, for example, to, uh, to sell wine in a Muslim village? Uh, well, if it's only Muslims, it's easy to say, no, we don't want it. But if you have people that, are, that might want to have wine for their kiddush in, in, in Shabbat, then maybe you need to allow it. So I think that ultimately to live in a shared society, you need to create also the structures, the policy structures, and not just de facto residents in the same apartment building. That happens. Uh, but again, I think that Rahad is better equipped to really answer that. OK. Um, there are two kinds of mixed cities in Israel. Those that were originally Arab, before 48, like Haifa and Yaffa and Lid and Ramli, and the Arab population became minority in the city. And those like Nofa Galil, my city, that were established as a Jewish townships, 
and became mixed because of Arab population moving in, because of the situation in the Arab localities, uh, 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 planning situation, education. They wanted better uh, um, future, and they moved uh, to those uh, uh, cities. And there are discrimination and gaps in both kinds of mixed cities, but the problem is more severe in the new mixed cities that were Jewish, like Nova Galil. And there, for example, in my in Nova Galil, I have two little kids. I take them every day to Nazareth to school because they do not have Arab school in uh, Nova Galil, and that's not because they didn't have the time to build the Arab school. It's a policy. I happen to um, uh, write the petition against the uh, municipality of Nova Galil for not having um, Arab schools, and the, uh, the municipality said. The first response was, this is a Jewish city. It will remain a Jewish city. We're not going to harm this uh, uh, identity of, of the city. We're not going to uh, build Arab schools. And then it just developed when we went to court. And they said, there's no need for Arab schools now. Arabs choose to leave the city every day in order to go and get proper education. And for your, and that's that's. One example, okay, but uh, uh, Muhammad uh, referred to uh, religion, cemeteries, uh, other uh, uh, kind of uh, cultural. Uh, uh, um, yes, and and I think you asked about the definition as mixed. I think it's important because that's why you face the policymakers with the fact that this is not a Jewish city, and there is population in the city that needs. Uh, um, services in terms of civil services and uh, uh, representation for their culture, for their uh, uh, religion, and other aspects of life. And I really wish that in the near or far future, we will be able to drop this uh, uh, identity, mixed identity, and talk about a city for all of its uh, uh, residents. But right now, I think it's part, it's important because. Uh, uh, you need to emphasize the fact that there is a mixed uh, a heterogeneous population that needs different kinds of uh, uh, services and equality in their own uh, townships. If, if I just may add one more sentence, one of the most problematic laws that uh, among the 20, 28 laws I mentioned was a law called the Acceptance Committee's Law. Uh, which grants power to 943 Jewish towns to form an acceptance committee that can decide who can buy, rent, or lease property there. Uh, it is relevant to smaller towns with less than 500 uh, families. And now they're going to increase the bar to towns with uh, less than 2,000 families. So it means that today, the actual meaning is that almost 68% of the land of Israel is prohibited for residency by Arab citizens. And if they increase the bar to 2,000 families in each uh, that can form such a committee, it means that almost 83% of the land of Israel will be prohibited for Arab citizens to live in. Wow. Um, thank you. Very enlightening. Um, one of our faculty members, Boaz at CLE, has a question. Thank you very much. Very, um, very interesting panel. Uh, so my my question is to Rahat. Uh, last spring I visited your uh, hometown, uh, Nazareth, and I talked to some people there about their opinion about the uh, the protest movement, like what's going on there. And basically they say, well, this is. This is a Jewish business. It's not. It's not our business. More or less like the the position that you put on. And so my question is, well, first, the problem is that if if uh, the process the protest does not succeed, the consequences not going to be returned to what it was. It's going to be much much worse with the current government. And I think it will be first and foremost worse for the for the uh, Arab citizens of Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, of course. Uh, but 
my question is, do you see an opening here, like I think Ayala suggested, uh, for a different kind of cooperation with the protest? And sure, there's a lot in the protest that doesn't kind of invite the Arab citizens in, the, the, the flags, the, et cetera. Some of it is done like for tactical reason uh, to, uh, to garner the support of, of the, uh, right, from the right side of the Israeli political um, spectrum. But, but there's a lot of, uh, of tension within the, process, uh, within the protest movement. Uh, and so my question is, is do, you, uh, do you see an opening there? for significant Arab participation that could actually lead a lot of the liberal Jewish population uh, to open their eyes even more to the inequality and to, uh, to make this uh, uh, participation part and parcel of the protest. Thanks. Um. First of all, you referred, I don't see you, Boaz, so yeah. <laughs> um, you referred to the Arab perspective of the protest as a Jewish one. I think that some of the protesters, leading protesters, also want to see it as a Jewish one from a tactical reasons. I understand some of them really are against the occupation, want the equality, but say, well, at the moment, it's, the, it's better to stick to the Israeli flag, to the national uh, um, um, Characteristic, characteristics of the of the protest, and that's why I think so. I think it's really complicated from both sides, and it makes it harder this integration. And the question is if the integration should be in the protest or in more creative kinds of protest. For example, I will share with you that I think that also my leadership, the Arab leadership, isn't doing enough against the threats that I mentioned at the beginning of my uh, uh, lecture that we know that are facing us together with the whole society, maybe in some uh, uh, areas even more. And I think that we should come with our perspective to the day after and our perspectives, our demands from the government and from the general society, and our interpretation to what's going on in the country and its effect on us as Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinians in the occupied territories. And I think that hasn't happened. What happened when the protest started is that Arabs saw the protest and says, this is not ours, we're not going to be part of it. But they did not bring to the table an alternative, the political uh, leadership. I think NGOs is just uh, breaking their heads with, <laughs> with trying to figure out how do we do it. But yes, I think that we can do more in that matter. And maybe this is the alternative, not going as individuals to the general protest that we, we, we will never be fully uh, uh, part of, but bringing our own, own protest to the general society and saying what we want, what are, the, what are our demands, what is the, 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 the roof or the uh, perspective, you know, how do we see uh, um, the day before. I think that this is more the, the way I think that we should be doing it. In, in, in addition to, uh, to trying, maybe as individuals and maybe in, uh, sh in the shared society sphere, to affect the current uh, protest, general protest, because the tactic reasons you said about uh, why the general protest should continue to be a you know, national uh, patriotic one, might be good for a very present success, but for, on the short term, they can succeed. They can stop, maybe block the legislations and the bad policies. But on the long term, I think that this will bring us more apart and create less and less shared society. And this is not on the benefit of anybody. So I think two things should happen. The Arab leadership and the Arab society putting their demands on the table, and the Jewish protest opening up to issues like the discrimination against the Arab society, collective rights for the Arab society, and ending the occupation. 
By the way, Boaz, I, I wrote a very long article about this. You can Google it. At the, it's called Conspicuous Absence, and it is at the website of the Robert Bosch Academy. So, in German and English for your sake also. Um, so we are coming up to one o'clock. Um, and uh, so we started 15 minutes late. We're ending 15 minutes late. I just want to quickly hear something um, from Rebecca and Ayala. I was thinking the whole time that you were all speaking so, so profoundly um, that you have excellent suggestions for things that need to happen. But in American history um, and sociology, there's a concept of civic culture and, and even sometimes called civic religion. And that needs to change in order for there to be the, the public will to put into place some of the mechanisms that you've all suggested. So what I'm curious about um, is what needs to happen in Israeli civic culture to enable you know these these protections and and to get the votes to have a government that respects minority rights and things like that what are some of the things that need to happen to get, have the schools built and everything I, I realize that that's very aspirational and and hard but but just quickly what would you each say and then if you want to add to it. Um, thank you it's a good question um, I'm happy to say that I think that the uh, civic culture is changing in Israel, okay? Um, and whoever has been following the protests for the past month when the Knesset has not been in session, okay? Um, when protests uh, are still talking about the general topic, but I think it was four weeks ago um, that it was all about women, okay? Um, there was a event of Inequi gender inequity, okay, that made the, the headlines and the protests totally embraced that. Okay, we're seeing that one event, that when there was violence um, of settlers uh, towards residents of Hawara, um, this is being adopted into the uh, protests and the, those voices are being um, brought in. Um, September 1st, not so far uh, ago. Um, Americans may know, not know September 1st is a major holiday in Israel. It's the first day um, of school. Uh, we're seeing uh, many, many more initiatives bottom up um, to trying to think about what a civic culture means in schools um, and how do um, students and parents and teachers reclaim um, their civic rights within uh, these frameworks. So I think that these are just a few uh, examples that I hope to see much more of. I'll say that we were talking uh, uh, yesterday, and I'm in a university in the states that was late to the DEI game, okay, that joined only in 2016. And one of the things that they um, talk about often is that being late to the game means that they're obligated to learn from everything um, that has already come, okay? They can't take their time figuring it out right now. Um, and kind of like looking uh, at some of these people that are very significant in Israeli civil society, I think that there's a lot of knowledge. Rebecca, you talked about some of that knowledge. The two of you have speak, uh, spoken about that knowledge. I think that the role of the new emerging leadership is to partner um, with civil society and start moving fast with all of the knowledge that's already available. Um, I'll, I'll just add briefly, I, um, I, I think we can take advantage of the enormous number of things, many of which we've also touched on, that are already out there and happening. Civic culture is not necessarily, I mean, some aspects of it are going to change top down, but much of it is going to be bottom up. And we've already talked about how there are gradual changes as you have more Arabs in the medical system and in the academic system and in the workplaces uh, and in public spaces. I see it in Jerusalem, which is a very divided city in so many ways, and yet there's more and more situations where you're seeing more women with hijab and people who are clearly Palestinian who are in, in sort of the Jewish public spaces of West Jerusalem. Those changes are, are A, some of the rise of the right as a response to that. Um, but it's also, it's something that is changing people's attitudes. It's forcing them to grapple with things. And I think there's where you have some changes in civic culture and tremendous potential uh, for civic culture. And again, some of it comes because, you know, if you've got dozens and dozens of workplaces, or uh, Muhammad's daughter is studying uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and she's, or she, human resources, and she's working at Superfarm, which is one of the major pharmaceutical uh, drugstores there. 
there's a huge number of Arabs who work, especially in the you know behind the counter. So many opportunities where people are in connection. How do you how do you make the adjustments around those living realities? I think that's actually a, right now every day there's opportunities to be adjusting and shifting and making a more robust civic society, which um, is more aware of it and more constructive and positive in how we take advantage of that reality. Thank you. I want to note that this. Uh, panel that is mostly women has been, has ended on more of a note of optimism <laughs> than any of the other panels. So just saying. Um, and, and it's right. So uh, enjoy your break.